I'm really looking forward to the uh, presentation today. The uh, title of the event is A History of Money in Palestine, the Case of the Frozen Bank Accounts of 1948. Uh, and when I, I first came across the, um, uh, the topic uh, and, and the, su the, the topic of the research uh, that will be presented here, um, I, I really was struck uh, by uh, the topic in general because um, despite all we hear about and talk about the narrative and the history of the events of 1948, so much of it is dominated by the loss of land and the expropriation of land and the acquisition of land and so on and homes and, and, and everything that goes along with it. But rarely do we hear about um, the uh, question here, which is the question of money, the question of bank accounts. And so uh, what was the case of the frozen bank accounts of 1948? And we're very fortunate to have with us today Srimadi Mitter, who has done research on this very question as part of her uh, doctoral work uh, and is uh, working on putting that um, uh, into a book for publication. Uh, she is the Ernest May Fellow at Harvard University, and she'll discuss this episode in Palestinian history, which has never before been written about. She will use it as well as a prism through which to explore how the fact of statelessness, which is generally thought of as a political condition, directly affects the economic and monetary lives of uh, ordinary people. She is, as I mentioned, working on a book based on this titled A History of Money in Palestine from the 1900s uh, to the present. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Srimadi Mitter. Thank you so much. It's really lovely to be here. It's an honor. Thank you, Yusuf. Yusuf's sort of given the whole game away. He's already explained my entire argument, so I might as well just make this very short and go home. But the story I'm going to tell you today begins on a particular date and with a particular event. On June 12, 1948, the new government of the new state of Israel issued an order to all banks still operating within its territory to freeze the accounts of all their Arab-Palestinian customers and to stop all transactions on all Arab accounts. The Israeli government gave the banks one month to comply with this order and threatened to revoke the banking licenses of all those banks which were found to be in non-compliance with it. By December 1948, six months after the termination of the British Mandate for Palestine and six months after the formation of this new state of Israel, every single bank which was operating in Israeli territory had complied with this order. And thus, by December 1948, six months after the termination of the Mandate for Palestine, every single Arab Palestinian who had had a bank account had lost access to the money and the valuables which they had kept for safekeeping in their banks. Six months. How could this have happened? Why did the banks comply with this order when the protection of their customers' accounts and valuables and money is the principle most sacred to all banks? Why was the order issued in the first place? And what did the Arab-Palestinian customers do about it? In answering these questions, I'm going to take you through the story of the frozen bank accounts of 1948, and I'm going to use it to pose a larger question about what it means to be stateless. I'm going to suggest that the condition of statelessness, which is generally thought of as a political problem, and it's treated as such in all the literature on the subject, it's a question of political rights, legal rights, that sort of thing. What I'm going to suggest is that statelessness also has a very important economic dimension, and that's really what my work focuses on, what I really try to highlight in all my broader projects. So while I'm going to talk about this episode of the frozen funds of 1948 today, I'd like to take just a minute to talk about my book project in general so that you can put it in context. So as Yusuf mentioned, I start in the early 1900s. It's a historical work, and I start with the waning years of the Ottoman Empire, and I focus on what happened to the bank accounts and particularly the financial assets of the Palestinian people who were living in Palestine at the time, particularly during the moment of transition during the World War I years. That's where my book opens. I look at basically what happens to the money and the assets of the Palestinians when the Turkish government, of, you know, which is at that point running Palestine, is basically issuing all these orders 
um, ordering all the Palestinians to, to switch to a new Turkish paper currency. When Palestinians to that point had been using silver and gold coins. During World War I, the Turkish government sort of desperately trying to fight World War I, you know, basically issues all this paper currency. And I sort of, you know, focus on that moment in time because that gets very much at this question that I'm, you know, really interested in, which is what happens to ordinary people? What happens to their economic and their financial lives during these moments of transition over which they have no control? So I start in the Ottoman period. My second chapter looks at the British Mandate period. The third chapter, which is really the central chapter of my work, is what I'll talk about today, which is 1948. It's really the central transition in Palestinian history. Then I look at 1967, and then I look at 1993. And through all these moments of you know, this big transition, when the state on the top is changing, I focus on two questions. What happened to people's economic and financial lives? through these transitions. People had to go to work the next day, no matter what's happening, whether it's the Ottoman or the British or the Israelis or the Jordanians or the Egyptians or whoever's in charge. What happened to their economic behavior? What happened to their financial lives? And the second question is what happened to their assets? Now, to get, now I'll get back to this question of what happened in 1948, but I'm going to use these stories of what happened to their assets, what happened to their financial lives to make two broad arguments about the economic dimensions of statelessness. And these are the arguments. The first is that stateless people, like the Palestinians, but not only the Palestinians, and that's a really important part of my work too, which is putting the Palestinians in context with stateless people everywhere. So our tendency to think of Palestine and the Palestinians is a very sort of unique situation. And partly what I'm trying to show is it's not. This is what happens to stateless people everywhere. And this is because stateless people are particularly vulnerable to dispossession because they don't have the protection of sovereign banking institutions of their own. And that's the first reason why they're so vulnerable to this sort of dispossession. The second reason is because they don't have a sovereign legal regime of their own. So they can't go to law courts, as we'll see in this story, they can't go to a law court and say, well, the bank's taken my money, can you help me? Because the law courts are siding with the entity, as we'll see in this case, which has ordered the confiscation of their assets in the first place. And the third reason is that stateless people like the Palestinians don't have a right to directly represent themselves at international fora such as the United Nations. They don't get a seat, in other words, at the table. They're represented by other people, the Jordanians or the Egyptians or the Arab League or whatever. There was no Palestinian seat at all these discussions at the UN at this moment in time. So for these three reasons, the lack of sovereign banking institutions, the lack of a sovereign legal regime, and the inability to directly represent themselves at international fora of diplomacy. <laughs> For these three reasons, stateless people are particularly vulnerable to being dispossessed of their financial assets. And that is a central argument I make today and is a central argument I make in all my work. But there's a second argument, no less important argument that I'll make today and that I really want you to take away with you. And that is that despite this vulnerability to dispossession, the Palestinians in the story nevertheless really fought for their rights. And, one of the, and they used many strategies to you know, fight for their rights. But one of the really surprising things that emerges from my research is the extent to which they turn to the law for the protection of their assets. And I'll tell you why I say this is surprising. You know, it's partly because, as Yusuf mentioned, you know, we hear a lot about 1948 and the dispossession of Palestinian land. We hear you know, about the houses. We hear about the property. But no one, literally no one, talks about this, this question of the bank accounts. And then, you know, the reason why I was so surprised when I was doing my research is not only does nobody talk about the bank accounts, nobody talks about this story, which is that the Palestinians sued the banks. They turned to the law courts to fight for their rights. Now, and this sort of, in many ways, goes against the grain of Palestinian historiography of this period, which the general tendency is to present the Palestinians as victims. You know, they were steadfast, the Samoans, you know, they, st they stood, you know, they, they tried to sort of be dignified, but they were victims. The central story is one of loss. Or we have other narratives. They were fighters, they were terrorists, they were guerrillas, they turned to arms, whatever word you want to use. We have those two narratives. They were victims or they were fighters. Nobody talks about, you know, yes, they were victims, and yes, they did fight, but they fought through law. And this fighting for law, this what historians call agency and what I'll call legal agency, is really an important conclusion of my work. And I'd really like you to take that away with you while keeping in mind you know, the story of this greater loss. 
So these are the two arguments I'll make today. And without further ado, let me turn to the story of the frozen bank account. If you'd like, you can take a look at the handout, which I think all of you had, you know, just so that you get a sense of the speed and rush of events. Now, I'll take you through this very, very quickly, because I don't have much time. I'll begin the story in November 1947, because this is the date of the UN uh, partition plan for Palestine. At this point in time, November 1947, fighting breaks out throughout the land of Palestine between Arab militias and Jewish militias. In February 1948, the British mandate authorities declare their intention to terminate the mandate for Palestine without specifying what's going to, what institution is going to take over, without saying anything about who's really going to take over this country of Palestine, without saying what's going to happen to anything. And, you know, very interestingly, saying that they don't say very much about anything, but the British do actually say the Palestinian currency, which had been the currency in place in Palestine for the last 20 years, is going to be folded up. So they do say that. They say almost nothing else about termination of the mandate for Palestine, but they do say there's no longer going to be a Palestine pound. That's in February 1948. Between February 1948 and May 1948, the land of Palestine is absolutely riven by fighting and by war. Um, this is also when, as, as some of you might know, this is the start of the Palestinian refugee crisis. You have hundreds and thousands of people you know, sort of fleeing their homes, in some cases being forced out, in some cases fleeing literally just fleeing for their lives. The UN has estimated there were about 800,000 um, Arab Palestinians who fled uh, you know, between November 1947 and May 1948. And the Arab Palestinian population of Palestine in 1947 is one million. So if 800,000 people have fled, you can just imagine the massive displacement of people. That's all happening during this time. On May 14, 1948, um, David Ben-Gurion uh, declares the independence of the State of Israel and a provisional new government of this new State of Israel is formed. That night itself, Arab armies invade uh, Palestine, invade this new country of Israel. And so the fighting, which had already been widespread, becomes even more so at that point in May 1948. On June 11, 1948, the first ceasefire is brokered between Jordan, Egypt, and Israel. June 11. On June 12, one day after that first ceasefire, the Israeli government issues that freeze order to all the banks to freeze the accounts of all the Arab Palestinian customers. Now, which were the banks that were affected by this order on June 12, 1948? There were basically three banks at this point in time that had Arab Palestinian customers. There were many banks in Palestine in during the mandate period, but there were three banks which had Arab customers. So these were the three banks that were affected by the order. Two of the banks were large international commercial banks. It was Barclays Bank, which was a big British bank, and it was also the quasi-official bank of the British Mandate government. At this point in time, June 1948, it is the largest bank in Palestine in terms of number of branches, number of account holders. And then there's the Ottoman Bank, which is also a very large international bank. As its name suggests, it used to be um, an Ottoman bank. It used to be, in fact, the quasi-official bank of the Ottoman government. But by this point in the story, in June 1948, it's actually been bought over by British and French interests. So it's a, it is a large commercial bank, in fact, headquartered in London by this point. So both Barclays and Ottoman banks have, British, uh, have Arab customers and Jewish customers and are therefore affected by this freeze order. And then there's a third bank, a smaller bank, called the Arab Bank, which is actually owned by an Arab Palestinian, run by Arab Palestinians, as, and has only Arab Palestinian customers. So these are the three banks which are affected by the Israeli freeze order. And the freeze order is issued on June 12, 1948. And all it says is, stop all transactions on all Arab accounts, freeze all Arab Palestinian account holders. So if you get a sense of what it meant to be a bank employee in one of these you know, branches of Barclays or Ottoman Bank at this time, June 12, 1948, as I've said, you know, the country is absolutely driven by war. The management of the banks are usually British, but they've all been evacuated by this time. They're all, they've all fled to Cyprus by February 1948. People who are left in the branches are Arab and Jewish uh, workers. They're clerks in the banks, both Arab and Jew. And they're sort of dealing with the situation of war. They're sort of deciding, well, should we go to work today? We go to work, what do we do about our customers? What do we do about our Arab customers? What do we do about our Jewish customers? Do we separate the accounts? Do we keep them together? You know, what do we do about our bank branches where every day a window is being shattered because there's a bomb outside on the street? So this is the situation in which this order arrives at their branches from this Israeli government. And June 12, 1948, the Israeli government has not been recognized by any um, international entity except the United States. 
So, you know, these branch managers in, you know, Jaffa branch, Jerusalem branch, they get this order and they absolutely don't know what to do about it. I was very, very lucky to be able to work in Barclays Bank archives in Withamshaw in England. And I was able to see the correspondence that, ca that comes out of this period. I was able to see the letters that, you know, branch officials in Jerusalem and Jaffa and Akka and Haifa were sending back to their managers in head office in London saying, we don't know what to do. We've got this order by this Israeli government and, you know, what should we do? And the response com comes back from London, which is the sort of classic of bankerly sort of evasion of any sort of trouble. It is do nothing. Do nothing. Ignore the order. Do nothing. So between June 1948 and October 1948, that's exactly what happens. The banks, Barclays and Ottoman Bank, absolutely do nothing in the sense that they ignore this order. In fact, the Ottoman Bank's manager, he's actually a British uh, man who has not been evacuated. He refuses to leave. He is a bit of a cowboy. He takes the entire Jerusalem branch, uh, like all the safe and all the money that they had in, and all the vaults that they had in the Jerusalem branch, he puts it into a truck and he drives to Amman. And he basically just sort of starts operating the Jerusalem branch of the Ottoman Bank out of a truck in Amman. And he basically says, anybody who can come to my branch, this truck, I'm paying them out. You have to be able to come there. If you can't come there, I can't help you. But if you can come to Amman, I'm paying you out. So this sort of goes on in October. At the end of October 1948, the Israeli government catches wind of this, that none of the banks are actually obeying its order, that people are being paid out. And the banks are actually quite overrun with customers withdrawing their money at this time. The Israeli government is absolutely furious at having been defied in this way. And what do they do? They revoke the trading license of the Ottoman banks as they had threatened to do in June. It says you can no longer operate within Israel. You've lost your license. This is when the Ottoman Bank's headquarters in London are like, oh my god, <laughs> you know, we've lost our trading license in Israel. This is a very, very big part of our business. What are we doing? They issue a reprimand to this cowboy of a bank, bank manager in Amman saying, stop paying out your customers. Stop paying out customers. Barclays Bank is watching what's happening with its colleagues in the Ottoman Bank and realizes that the Israeli government is actually serious about revoking trading licenses. So, so Barclays Bank, by October 1948, also stops paying out customers. Customers come to the bank, Arab customers come to the bank branches, and they're told, sorry, can't pay you out. We've been ordered by the Israeli government to freeze your accounts. That's in October 1948. In December 1948, there's a big turning point because the Israeli government in December issues these emergency proclamations, which are, you know, we, we know about them later because later in March 1950 they're codified into law. These are the famous absentee property legislation. But in December 1948, they're just called emergency regulations concerning the property of absentees. That's the terminology. And it is this emergency proclamations are given status in law. They're codified in law because they've been passed by the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. At that moment, when the military order of June 11th becomes a law on December 1948, that's when the banks really begin to obey. And they say, as of December 1948, we have frozen all our Arab-Palestinian customers' accounts, and we've stopped all transactions on all Arab accounts in December 1948. In February 1949, there's another turning point. The Israeli government issues a new order to all the banks, yet again, saying you can't just freeze the accounts, you can't just stop the transactions, you have to transfer all Arab accounts, everything, cash and valuables, so safety deposit boxes, over to a new branch of the Israeli government, which is called the Israeli custodian of absentee property. Those of you who speak Hebrew. We've created this new bureaucracy, and all the banks, you know, Ottoman and Barclays bank branches, have to transfer over all the accounts that have been since October frozen into this new bureaucracy. The banks, when they get this order, are actually quite relieved because in February 19, till February 1949, what's happened is they're listing all these things on their books. They're still showing that they have all these account holders on their books. So they have this weird cash position on their books where they're showing they have these accounts but they're not paying them out, they're frozen. And you know, for those of you who know banking law and banking accounting rules, this is the worst nightmare for any bank, to have something on your books as a liability, but you can't actually serve that liability. In February 1949, when they asked to basically transfer over all those accounts to the Israeli custodian of absentee property, they're very happy to write checks, because that means it resolves the cash position. The money is no longer on their books. It's gone over to the Israeli government. So in February 1949, Barclays Bank, Ottoman Bank, write checks 
transferring all the accounts of all Arab Palestinian customers to the Israeli custodian of absentee property. And thus, in February 1949, the dispossession of the Palestinians is complete. Now I'll talk a bit about the Arab Palestinian customers themselves. And I'll talk about how they reacted to this, this moment of you know, having their bank accounts frozen. Before I do that, let me talk a bit about how much money are we talking about so that you can think about who are these people who are affected by this order. Now it's actually very, very difficult to get at the numbers. Um, I did a lot of work in Barclays Bank archives. I worked a lot in the Israeli state archives and in British national archives. But it's actually quite difficult to get at exactly how much money was frozen. So the number I'm going to tell you is a number that I feel comfortable estimating, but it's not set in stone. So based on the sort of piecemeal archival evidence, you know, looking at Barclays' correspondence, looking at UN correspondence, looking at Israeli government correspondence, I feel comfortable saying that it was about six million pounds that was frozen in 1948. Um, this corresponds to 10,000 to 50,000 bank accounts. Now that's a big range, 10,000 to 50,000, but that seems to be about right. On the low end, it's 10,000. On the high end, it's 50,000. Now to put this number in some sort of context, six million Palestinian pounds in 1948 is about 43% of the total Palestinian exports in 1945. So total, Arab and Jewish economy combined. Total exports were about 14 million in 1945. So this is about 43%. So it's a huge amount. It's not an insignificant amount. Um, to put it in present value terms, what would the six million pounds be worth today? Again, that's a very imprecise calculation. It's very, very difficult to get at the number, but it's about using um, World Bank's present value calculator. Six million Palestinian pounds in 1948 is about 800 million uh, pounds today in 2013 terms. So it's not an insignificant amount of money. Now, who were these Arab Palestinians to whom these six million pounds belong? Who were the account holders of these 10 to 50,000 uh, bank accounts? I'm going to make an argument that they were ordinary people. Th they were ordinary people. And they were neither the political elites, which has been the obsession of much of Palestinian historiography, nor were they the peasants, which has been the other obsession of Palestinian historiography. And we hear a lot about these two classes of people, the elite, the political ayan, or the peasants. We don't actually hear about the people in the middle who were neither of these two groups. And I'll tell you why I think these were the people you know, who are concerned by this story. The political elite, well, financial elites, firstly, by June 1948 have actually left. They sort of read the writing on the wall, and they'd left long by, you know, this freeze order is issued in June 1948. By then, you know, those who could had really left taking their money with them. So financial elites are out of the picture. Political elites who stayed, they didn't bank with the Barclays Bank or the Ottoman Bank because it, you know, they were nationalists. It was sort of impolitic to be banking with Barclays Bank if you're a Palestinian nationalist fighter fighting against the British. These people banked with the Arab Bank. Remember I told you there was a third bank in the story, and that was the Arab Bank. And the Arab Bank was actually founded by a Palestinian, Abdul Hamid Shoman, whose whole shtick was that we are a Palestinian nationalist bank. And if you're a Palestinian nationalist leader, you better bank with them and not with Barclays or Ottoman. And the Arab Bank refused you know, to obey this freeze order. So political elites had their money in the Arab Bank. They were fine, because the Arab Bank never obeyed the order. Financial elites have left. The peasants, vast majority of Palestinian population at this time, I don't think they would have had bank accounts. I have no proof for that, but I just don't think they would have been, you know, the customers of Barclays and Ottoman Bank. That leaves the people really largely in the middle, the people who are sort of the forgotten Palestinians in all this story. And you know, all of this, you know, I don't want to make this too much of a class story because, you know, I, I couldn't come across, I, you know, the bank wouldn't release the names of the customers or anything like that, but I could come across the range of the accounts. You know, wh what, wh how much money were, you know, was an individual account, and it's a wide range. There, were, there was an account of 50,000 pounds, which was huge in those days. There's also accounts for 10 pounds. And, you know, one of the accounts I came across, you know, many of the accounts I came across were signed by thumbprints, not by signatures. So it gives you a sense of, you know, this is not overtly a middle class story necessarily. There are illiterate people who, for whatever reason, would have banked with Barclays Bank. I'll just give you one example. I was very lucky to be able to work with the American Colonies archives. For those of you who've been to the region, the American Colonies is this really fancy hotel in Jerusalem. At that point in time, it was a pilgrim guest house, and it employed many Palestinian Arab staff. And one of the Arab Palestinian staff was a cook, um, a cook by the name of Helwe. 
no last name. And she had been told by her bosses, who are all the American colonists, who are Scandinavian, American, whatever, church-going people, I think she'd been told by her, these people, you should put your money in a bank. That's how you keep your money safe. That's how you become modern. You don't give it to your dad. You don't give it to your husband. You open a bank account. We'll open it for you. We'll go with the Barclays Bank, because that's where we bank. And so in Barclays Bank registers, I found an account. For, it literally says, the maid Hillworth, signed by a thumbprint. And she had 10 pounds in her account. And those 10 pounds were frozen, which probably constituted her entire life savings. So this, just to give you a sense of the texture of you know, who are these people whose bank accounts are frozen, it's not just middle class rich people. It's not, you know, it isn't even just middle class, you know, middle class people. It's often these kinds of people. All right, so how did these people, these kinds of people react to this experience of having their bank accounts frozen? I'll give you a couple of anecdotes so that you can get to the heart of the story. The first is a story of a man called Michel Karkar. Michel Karkar was, in 1948, a boy aged 14. He came from the town of Lidda in central Palestine. And he, along with his family, were these famous Liddawis who, were, who went on this forced march. They were thrown out of their houses and made to march eastwards towards Ramallah. Those of you who read this New York article that came out in October, it really talks about this story of this, you know, what happened to the Arab families of Lidda. Michel's father and his uncle were gold merchants. They weren't very rich, they were illiterate people, but they had a lot of cash on them because that's what they did. They were gold merchants. They were actual sarraf. They, they were money changers and gold merchants. So they had an account with the Ottoman bank. Michel's father and uncle were killed in the course of that long march from Lidda to Ramallah in 1948. Michel was 14 years old and he was the oldest boy in the family. When the family reached Ramallah, he realized that their situation was absolutely desperate. Their father and uncle have been killed. There's, they have no money. They've literally just got their possessions on their back. And he was like, well, you know, I've got to step up. I've got to be the man here. 14-year-old boy. He marches into the Ottoman Bank's branch in Jerusalem, asks to see the branch manager, who till this day he remembers the branch manager's, branch manager's name. It's a Mr. Whitfield. And he says, you know, my father and my uncle have died. Um, they have an account with the Ottoman Bank. It's 700 pounds. He knows exactly how much money they have. And I need it because my family is desperate. The Ottoman branch manager looks at this boy and he says, I'm really sorry, your money's there. This is before the money's been transferred in February. This is still in October 1948. Branch manager looks at this boy and says, I'm sorry, your money's there, but it's frozen. The word frozen in Arabic is mujammil. Michel tells me the story recently. I've, been, I've known him over the last few years. He's now an 80-something-year-old man who lives in Ramallah. This story happened 60 years ago when he was a boy of 14. He's told me the story over and over and over again. And each time he tells me the story, the details are so precise. He remembers it exactly. And he keeps telling me, Mujamid, Mujamid, Shumana, Mujamid. What is this word? You know, just the bafflement caused by that word and being told by the branch manager that, that your father's account is there. It's safe. We've got it. But you can't touch it. Mujamid, it's frozen. Michel tells me, you know, he, you know it's, it's quite funny. Every time he tells me the story, he always insists on one detail, and that is that he was wearing shorts. When he went into the bank branch, he says, I was just a little boy, left the pantalon, you know, I was wearing these shorts, you know, and he sort of starts shouting and screaming at the branch manager. The shock is so great. You know, he just starts crying and throwing a tantrum in the bank branch to the extent that the, the bank throws him out. And that's Michelle's story. And just as you can get a sense of the trauma that this caused in this young boy of 14 years old who's lost his family. I'll tell you another story. And this is a story of a man called Theodor Sarouf. A very different kind of story from Michelle. So Michelle's story, you can get a sense of the class background of this person. He's you know, not necessarily illiterate, but not very wealthy. I'll tell you the story of a man called Theodor Sarouf, which is a very different kind of story. Theodor Sarouf was a young, swashbuckling entrepreneur in Jaffa. He was in his 20s. He was apparently very given to wearing beautiful clothes. He always used to wear white suits and a hat. You know, he was this very, very sort of beautifully dressed man. And he was an entrepreneur. He was one of these, you know, the first entrepreneurial class of Palestine who really flourished in the 20s and the 30s in the cities of Jaffa and Haifa and Jerusalem. And he established the first Arab advertising agency in Jaffa in 1927. This was called Sadruf's Advertising Agency. Theodore had a bank account with Barclays. He was a Jaffa. We, like many people from Jaffa, he actually fled to Beirut during the fighting, taking 200 pounds with him. After the 200 pounds had finished and he, you know, he's in Beirut, realizes he can't go back to Jaffa, he walks into Barclays' branch and, you know, with his beautiful suit and his hat and all of that. And he says, you know, Barclays' branch, please can I withdraw my money, the rest of my money that I have in my branch in Jaffa. 
and Barclays branch manager in Beirut looks at Theodore Sarouk and says, sorry, Mr. Sarouk, your money's there, but it's frozen. It's the exact same story. And Theodore had actually died by the time I was doing my research. This story is told to me by his son. His son told me that this was such a trauma in his father's life. Now, his father was actually fine. Like a lot of these quite wealthy entrepreneurial people, he found his feet in Beirut. He had family. You know, he wasn't destitute, or, you know, like, like many other Palestinians were. He was okay. Built his life, you know, was fine. When he died, his son told me that they discovered that he had 27 different bank accounts in Beirut. Each one had a tiny amount of money squirreled away in it because he never trusted banks again. So these stories are just, a, you know, my, my book is actually full of these stories, and I really hope, you know, I hope I can write it firstly, and I hope, you know, that many of you will turn and read it. But this g just gives you a sense of how the Palestinians, right, the trauma that this, that this experience caused to these very different kinds of Palestinians. But, you know, it's not just a story of trauma. The Palestinians didn't just, you know, sit and cry as Theodos, uh, you know, as Michel Karkar did. They actually, in this case, really fought for their rights. First, they started by writing letters to the bank, you know, and I was, because I was able to work in the bank's archives, I was able to come across, the, and the bank archives are full of these letters written by their customers, you know, making claims, not making political claims, not talking about Zionism, not talking about Israel. They're writing as customers to banks, saying, we are the customer of Barclays Bank, we are a customer of Waterman Bank, we have a contract. I put my money for safekeeping in the bank, and you're supposed to release it whenever I come, you know. This is how banks work. And it's very interesting to, s to, to read the wording of these letters because it also gives us a sense of a clue of who are these customers of the banks. So, you know, these are people who really bought into that project of modernity that banks represent. I have a feeling their fathers and their grandfathers would have been the sort of people who put money in grounds and holes, or holes in the wall in their houses. These people went with banks. So it really actually hurt the very people who believed most in this project of banks, in this project of modernity. These were the people who suffered most from this confiscation of their accounts. So they wrote all these letters saying, you know, release our money, how can you do this? You know, how can you be a bank, a British bank can do this? The bank's response, when it came, the banks always responded. They took their time to respond, but they did always respond. And the letters were, again, you know, this model of bankerly evasive language. And they sort of said that, you know, we're very sorry. We don't want to freeze your accounts, but we are obeying the laws. The laws are those of the state of Israel. And until we are allowed by the sovereign entity of the state of Israel to release your accounts, we can't do anything. Please know that you are a valued customer and we really appreciate your business, and we hope you will continue banking with us, blah, 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 blah. You know? This every single letter sort of almost following this model of, you know, we can't do anything. Our hands are tied, but we're very sorry. You know, we, this is a bad situation for us as well. So letter writing campaign to the banks doesn't work. Palestinians then take it to the British government. And they write to the British government. And I worked in the British National Archives in Kew in London. And I, you know, found a lot of letters written to British Foreign Office by Arab Palestinian customers, again, making very similar claims, not making political claims, making a claim about what it means to be a customer of a British bank and saying, you know, as a British government, you should intervene and you should help us. And some of the letters are actually quite interesting because they employ this quite sort of flattering language. You know, they write to the British government saying, we know the British are the champions of the Arabs in Palestine, and can you, no mention of Israel, can you please sort of write to the Barclays Bank and Ottoman Bank, can you tell your country's banks to, you know, it's sort of that kind of language. The British government, you know, this is 1949 already, is really troubled by this whole thing, this episode of the Frozen, really embarrassed because it's British banks. They wouldn't care if it was an Egyptian bank or something. It's British banks, you know, British name, all of that, you know, many people in British Foreign Office at that point in time, and actually today, are obsessed with this idea of Britain's name in the world, Britain's reputation in the world. So <laughs> British government is very, very divided. There are foreign, uh, foreign office officials who feel they should lean on the banks and make the banks release the uh, accounts. And there are people who feel in the British Foreign Office that it's really not Britain's place, that this is the matter of a sovereign country, which is Israel, and Britain can't intervene. And to give you some context, at this point, Britain and Israel have this very sort of awkward, uneasy relationship. The British and the Israelis and the Jordanians are at this point negotiating with each other on all the end of mandate stuff. So there's this whole vast machinery of the mandate government, which has just sort of been left, you know, out sort of in flames. And, and there are all sorts of things, all sorts of odds and ends that need to be tied up. Things like, you know, who pays the pensions of the people who work for the British mandate official? What happens to the tables and chairs of all the, you know, what happens to the infrastructure of the mandate government? Who pays out the bond, uh, you know, uh, 
coupons and things like that. So the British government is actually at this point in time undergoing these lengthy negotiations with the Israeli government and all this stuff. And they feel that they just can't bring up the frozen bank accounts because it's, it would complicate matters too much and the Israelis would say, as the Israelis did say, that this is a matter for us. This is our internal state sovereignty. What does Britain have to do with this? So what the British government eventually does officially is that they advise all the Arab Palestinians who are writing to them, take up this matter directly with the Israelis. If the Israelis have said this is a matter for Israeli sovereignty, take it up with them. And that's what, the, in, in fact, many Arab Palestinians do. I did some work in the Israeli state archives, and I found letters written in quite broken Hebrew. You can tell it's been translated from Arabic or English into Hebrew, writ written to David Ben-Gurion, you know, writing things very similar to the letters that have been written to the British government, saying, you know, uh, not making any political claims, nothing, very carefully sort of saying, can you release our money? And, you know, one of the really interesting letters I found was a letter written from a Haifa merchant. You know, so this proves that it wasn't only the absentees, the people who left. It was also Haifa merchant, somebody who'd never left, whose money had been frozen. He's written in Hebrew to David Ben-Gurion saying, can you release my uh, money? But, of course, the Israeli government writes back saying, we're really sorry, we can't release the money because we're fighting a war with the Arabs, and when there's peace, we'll release the money. And this is sort of the Israeli rhetoric, which is this is a wartime measure, and this is what countries do in times of war. Uh, the moment there's peace, we'll release the money, and we look forward to that and all of that. So, so writing to the Israelis doesn't go anywhere either. The UN gets involved uh, from very early on in the story. This is actually a working group uh, within the UNCCP. That's the UN Conciliation Committee for Palestine. That's actually created to deal with this, you know, bank accounts issue. But you know, they, you know, just keep meeting all over the all the, all over the place all the time. But nothing is resolved because it always comes up against this problem of the Israelis saying. Until there's peace, we're not going to release the accounts. So by 1953, the Palestinians are absolutely fed up. They're fed up because nothing is working. The UN isn't helping. The British aren't helping. The banks aren't doing anything. And they finally decide to take matters into their own hands. And what do they do? They sue. They decide to sue the banks. They know they can't sue the Israeli government, so they sue the banks. They first, it's actually the Arab bank. Remember I told you there was this third bank, the Arab bank. It's actually the Arab bank, which had a big account with Barclays Bank. Because, you know, Barclays Bank was the biggest bank during the mandate, so it was sort of like a uh, central bank. So a lot of the smaller banks also had accounts with Barclays Bank. And the Arab Bank had 500,000 pounds with the Barclays Bank, which had also been frozen. So the Arab Bank is actually the first Palestinian entity to sue a British bank. And they sue in the British courts in April 1953. And in fact, this lawsuit becomes a seminal lawsuit in banking history because it really becomes an interesting case of what are the rights and duties of banks to their customers in times of war. And the, and the lawsuit goes all the way from the lower court all the way to the British House of Lords, which is the highest court in Britain. And at each stage of the case, the courts decide in Barclays' favor, saying that Barclays, in this situation, was right to freeze the account of the Arab bank because uh, an order had been issued to the banks, and banks are supposed to obey orders. Banks aren't supposed to opine on the legalities of anything. They're just supposed to obey the orders if the order is coming from a sovereign state. And that's why I started my talk by saying this has so much to do with statelessness, because it really revolves around this question of Israel's sovereign legal status in British courts. So a British lawsuit you know, goes all the way to the British House of Lords. doesn't work out. Palestinians lose their case. But there are two Palestinian lawyers watching the proceedings from afar, and they realize that that's exactly you know, the problem, that the British courts are going to agree with the banks because the British courts are going to say that the Israeli order was, you know, was, was what was issued and the banks have to obey the Israeli order. These two young Palestinian lawyers, Fuad and Aziz Shahadeh, they realize that if they can find a legal regime which is not going to recognize Israel, then they have a chance of winning. And that's exactly what they do. Barclays Bank and Ottoman Bank both have branches all over Jordan. You know, including jo Jerusalem, which is you know, half uh, uh, under Jordanian rule. And they decide to find a group of Palestinian plaintiffs. They gather together 50 Arab Palestinians of varying you know, class and background, and they file 50 different lawsuits on the same day in various different courts, Nablus, Jerusalem, Amman, against Barclays and Ottoman Bank at the same time. So Barclays management the next day wakes up, and they find they have 50 different lawsuits that have been filed against them in 50 different courts in Jordan. 
the lawsuits take a very, very long time, you know, but in the end, the lawsuits go exactly as the lawyers had predicted. They go in the Palestinians' favor because the Jordanian courts, and you know, it's the exact same question that the British courts were deciding on, which is should the banks have obeyed this order? And the Jordanian courts decided no. They said the banks should not have obeyed this order because the order was not issued by a sovereign entity. It was issued by an illegal entity, the State of Israel, which is not recognized at this point by Jordanian courts. And so Barclays Bank and Ottoman Bank find themselves one fine morning in 1956 with 50 different lawsuits that have gone against them, ordering them to pay back their customers. But they've won the lawsuit in Britain. So they're in this weird position where they've won in Britain, they've lost in Jordan, they don't know what to do, and they're absolutely fed up at this point. So the Barclays and Ottoman Bank decide to get together, and I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll say the story very, very quickly, and I can talk more about it during the Q&A. They get together a delegation, and they fly to Israel, and they meet the Israeli government, and they say, this is embarrassing, we've spent so much money fighting these lawsuits, we've lost the lawsuits, you have to release the money. And the Israeli government says, no, we're not gonna release the money, war time, all the stuff that the Israeli government has been saying. And the banks say, okay, fine, don't release the money, we're pulling out of Israel. And then the Israeli government says, okay, wait, the Israeli government says, okay, we'll be willing to unfreeze the money, but the problem is that we've spent all the money. You know, and this is Israel in 1956, you know, is in a very, very difficult situation itself. It's absolutely overrun by refugees itself, you know, people fleeing the Holocaust. It's applied for loans to Britain and hasn't got any money, absolutely cash out. It's not the Israel of today. It is this country that's struggling for its own survival. And it says, this six million pounds, we spent it, you know, five years ago. So if you give us a loan for that amount, <laughs> Interest-free, payable over a long period of time, we'll be willing to release the account. The banks agree, and that's in the end what happens. Ottoman Bank and Barclays Bank form a loan syndicate and issue a loan for 12 million pounds to the Israeli government. Interest-free, actually it wasn't interest-free, it was very, very low interest, payable over a 20-year period. And the Israeli government, in return, releases, in principle, those six million pounds, and in principle, Barclays and Ottoman Bank then proceed to pay out all their customers. I want to end the story here because, uh, you know, it's, uh, I want to end on a happy note, and it's this really, really rare case in Palestinian history which almost never happens, which is that everybody is happy. The Israelis who are cash-strapped and really desperate and struggling at this point in time get a loan. They've applied for loans all over the place, they've been refused by everyone, but they get a loan and a significant, a 12 million pound loan from Barclays and Ottoman Bank. The banks managed to get rid of this headache of these lawsuits and this bad publicity that all of this had been generating, and they get to walk away with the story of, you know, look, we're British banks and we're so reliable because after all, we released the money. British government gets to say, look, you know, this is what the British, you know, ideas of fairness and fair play, see, we released the money in the end. And the Arab Palestinians, who lost every single battle since 1936 and so much more since 1948, won this once and they got their money back. Thank you. Question or what? How did they know it was an Arab? Arab account. Mm -hmm. Did they have, like in under the Nazis, you had to declare you were such and such? What yeah. happened? What's the legal basis? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great question. Would you like me to answer yeah, the question? Please. Please. Uh, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. It's quite interesting. Um, the the when the freeze order came, all it said was Arab accounts. But the people who were working in the bank branches, they were all locals. They were Arab or Jewish Palestinians, and they would have known just by looking at the names. So they literally went down the register. Once the order had come from London to obey the, this Israeli order, they looked at the register, they looked at the name, any name that sounded Arab to them, they froze. And quite, what's quite interesting is that there were a lot of Jewish Arabs um, in Palestine, not as many as came after the fact, but certainly by 1948 there are Jewish Arabs, and all their accounts were <laughs> frozen as well. So then they wrote to the Israeli government saying, you know, why has our account been frozen? And that's how I know that this is how it happened, because I found letters in the Israeli state archives from Jews who said, my account has been frozen, but I'm a Jew. And then those accounts were released. So it was literally some guy sitting at the bank branch, looking at the register saying, this sounds like an Arab name. This, it was legal, though, because uh, remember I said that it was the legalization of this order that really caused the turning point. 
So when the emergency proclamations are given status in law in December 1948, that's when the banks really sit up and take notice. That, you know, remember I said initially they just ignored the order. So the legalization of this order is, was very, very important to the banks because until it became legal, until it was given the status of law as passed by the Knesset in, on December 12, 1948, it was this gray you know, zone where some bank branches were obeying, some weren't, you know, all of that. So the legalization of it is absolutely, very much like in the Nazi case, a very important element of this story. Thank you. You mentioned that the Arab Bank did not comply. Mm -hmm. oh, so how did they um, evade the consequences? And then what happened to the money um, of, what happened to the clients who had money in the, of in the Arab bank? The Arab bank complied, uh, didn't comply because they actually closed up their branch in May 1948 when they realized that Israel had, you know, that the country had been divided between Jewish and Arab and they sort of moved into Jordan and they reopened their branch in Amman. They closed all their branches that remained on the other side. So they refused the Israeli freeze order, but they were never in Israeli jurisdiction so that their trading license could never be refused. This is a, you know, it's a really interesting, and this is where the details of the story become so interesting, because what happened to the Arab-Palestinian customers of the Arab bank who remained in Israel, who remained, for example, in Haifa, who couldn't get to the Arab bank? The Arab bank's whole story, in fact, its foundational myth is we never froze the accounts of the Palestinians. We were the one bank that you know, remained steadfastly true to our customers. And it's absolutely true. But the customers had to be able to go to Amman or Jordanian Jerusalem or Nablus or whatever to withdraw their money. But those who were left in Haifa and other places in, in, which, in which became Israel, they could not get their money back till the Arab bank was allowed back into Israel under the Oslo period in 1993. And it's, uh, you know, I've actually tracked down some of these Haifa families who then went to the Arab bank and sued the Arab bank, saying, you know, you can't just pay us back whatever the amount was in 1948. You have to pay us back with interest. And um, no matter how many times I asked the Arab bank, you know, I begged and begged and begged. I asked them to show me these documents. They refused because they settled out of court. Yeah. But they did pay. You know, anyone who could go to the Arab bank, they did. This is actually more of a remark than a question. I, I understand that you're writing all of, this, all of this research in a book. Yeah. Which is, which is fantastic. But I have an issue with the terminology about Arab Palestinians mm -hmm. and Jews. Mm -hmm. Because the Arab Palestinians and the Arab Jews mm -hmm. are Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather f see you using the Palestinian Christians and Muslims versus the Palestinian Jews and the non-Palestinian Jews. Um, I actually use the terminology which was historically accurate for the time. So if you notice throughout my talk, I use the word Arab Palestinian, not Palestinian, which is I think what you're getting at, no, or no, Arab no, Jew. No, I mean during the. No, I mean during the mandate, it is actually the terminology that's used. So the mandate, uh, all, pal all people who lived in Palestine were either called Jewish Palestinians or Arab Palestinians, and that's not a terminology I agree with. It's just the terminology that was used, and that's the language that's used in my sources. So when the freeze order is issued to the banks, that initial June 12 freeze order, it, sa it doesn't even say Arab-Palestinian. In fact, it says, as I said, stop all transactions on all Arab accounts. Then that Arab word you know, sort of vanishes from the, when it becomes legalized in December, it's absentees. The word Arab disappears from the, the only reason I know it says Arab is because of the telegram that Barclays' uh, staffers in Jerusalem sent to their offices in London saying, we've been issued a military order saying freeze all Arab accounts. By December 1948, even the word Arab has uh, sort of disappeared from that thing and it's now absentee. So the terminology is very important and I, I absolutely take your point. It's just that as a historian, I, I tend to use with footnotes uh, explaining the usage. Yeah, yeah certainly, but I'm, te I'm using the terms that are yeah, historically yeah, accurate. No, absolutely. I mean, it's not. I don't. It's not. I don't make as a historian any judgment on the term. I'm just using the terms that were used. I mean, when I write my later chapters, I don't use the word Arab Palestinian at all. I use the word Palestinian because that's what they became. Mm -hmm. So I stick to the terms which are historically accurate for the period um, in which I'm writing. In, my, in the Ottoman period, you know, it's different terminology because they don't use the word Palestinian. They use the word Arab inhabitants of, um, uh, not even of, you know, whichever Musa Sharif they're living in. So I try to stick 
in each chapter of my book to the terms that are being used in the sources. With and I explain in each case. Don't worry, there'll be footnotes. Mm -hmm. But thank you for that. Yeah. Um, other questions uh, on this? From our audience, I had a question for you. Yes. A cou couple questions, actually. If you could talk a little bit about sort of the sources that you used in bringing all of this um, information together. Uh, and I know we chatted at one point about how many customers actually got mm -hmm. their assets back. Yeah. Um, and many of them did, but many of them also didn't. If you have a sense of, um, you know, how many actually were able to go through all of the hoops and, 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 and the legal processes to actually get their, their claims um, uh, addressed. Yes, thank you. No, these are two really great questions. I'm glad they came up. So in terms of sources, um, I was very lucky to be able to work with a real diversity of sources. I've mentioned some of them already. So I worked in the Israeli State Archives, which is where I got a lot of the Israeli documentation. I worked in the British National Archives in Kew in London, which is where I lo got a lot of the British Foreign Office story. I worked in Barclays' Bank Archives, which is a very, very important part of my research. But I also really worked with oral sources. And, and you know the stories that I've told you of Michelle Karkat, Kedar Sarouf, many, many more stories that are in my work, it's all based on interviews I did while living in Palestine. And basically, my strategy was to go and live in Palestine and talk to every single elderly person I could find. And you find one elderly person, and you become his friend, and then he introduces you to all his buddies. And you know, at some point, I became, I really became sort of like an honorary member of the elders club in all these different cities. And you know, most of the time, they would be sitting around and gossiping and telling me, you know, whose widow is doing what with whose widow and all of that, and not talking about any of the stuff. But you know, I really got a lot. I, I learned a lot from you know just these evenings spent with all my khatia. You know, they used to say Srimati al khatia. You know, my I had this whole gang of old, well, elderly people who are. You know, some of whom have died in the course of my, you know, and I feel, I feel very, very emotional about, you know, partly because my dissertation took a while to write. This is the story I've told you today. It's actually the story of my dissertation, which I'm now turning into a book. And you know, so many of the people who've told me their life stories, who've told me little things that might not have made it into the final picture, but have really formed my understanding of this period. So many of them are just gone, and so many of them would say, you know, hurry up! What are you doing? Why are you taking so long? And, you know, I, I feel very that it is incumbent on me to rush and, and to write as well as I can but to really not take a long time over it because there are still some people left alive and Michelle Karka is still alive remember I told you these lawyers uh, the younger brother of those lawyers one of them is still alive in fact much of the story that I've told you today of the, the Jordanian court that story nobody knows anything about it. it all comes from his law firm's archives he literally invited me into his house and he opened up his basement to me and they were like, you know, to call it an archive is to exaggerate what it is. It's boxes and boxes and boxes of documents in somebody's basement. And I was just very lucky that I was able to find him and that he was able to, you know, give me this stuff and that I was able to work through this material that for a historian is gold uh, because, you know, nobody's ever reached that. So that's your first question. And the second question, yes, the, I mean, it is actually very difficult to know how, mu how many people actually got their money back. Remember I said I want to end on this happy note because it's a happy ending, everybody got their money back. In principle, that's true. The, ba the Israelis first did release the money, and the banks then, you know, the UN got involved in this payout scheme, and there was all this ecstasy of forms and all of this stuff that the UN does well, working groups and forms and this procedure and that procedure. So in principle, everybody whose account was frozen did get it back. In practice, I doubt if it's even 50%. Partly because the Palestinian population is so scattered. There are refugees living in camps. They're sort of all over the place. How many of them even knew about this? You know, so many of these elderly people that I talk to, when I ask them about these bank accounts, they're sort of flabbergasted. When I asked Theodor Sarouf's son, you know, the guy in the white suit from Jaffa, when I asked him, I was like, but why didn't your father get his money back? There was a settlement. And he was like, what settlement? What are you talking about? So it's really strange that, and it's actually quite sad that the money was released, but I have a feeling you know, one of the reasons why Barclays was so difficult to work with and why they were so careful about what they would release to me and what they wouldn't, is I have a feeling a lot of the money is still sitting in Barclays' books, and they don't know what to do with it because it hasn't been claimed and it's been 60 years. It's really hard to get at the numbers, but I think I saw some correspondence in 1964, Barclays' internal correspondence, saying, what are we doing about the Arab unclaimed accounts, uh, Palestinian Arab unclaimed accounts? And it said something like 54% has been claimed so far. And that's in 1964. Yeah. Um, could you 
we do have a couple more questions uh, there in the back. Why don't we, because we are running short on time. We're yeah, I, I just want to <laughs> clarify one thing. It's sure. the 14 mm. I hope you don't use the terminology mm in your book because it's, it's like million, million, but I know it's mills, uh, thousand, thousand. This is old imperial system. No, M uh, stands for mega here. No, it's actually just million. I meant million. Yeah, but million, million, this is like 12 zeros. No, it's just million. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's 12 million. Yeah, yeah thank Six you. Six million pounds. Just million. clarification, yes. that's all. Right, your question thank here you. and the question here back to back, and we'll try to have you respond to both of them. Okay, sure. Great. Sure. Uh, it's, sure. it's fantastic to hear that there is, you know, a, a happy perspective, but I guess when you get to the the core issues of the numbers, it's really the, the British banks on their, sorry, on their reputation, on their reputation bailing out theft um, from the money that was stolen. And, and then- Sorry, could you repeat that? So, so in the sense of Israel saying, oh, we, we, we spent it all. And then the bank saying, oh, well, okay, we'll create a loan. Yeah. Well, was, if, if you're kind of going by the cold, you know, the actual numbers, yeah. <laughs> you go through history of the last 60 years, there are many loans that are never paid back or right. become grants or become, right. they sit on the books. So uh, were these loans ever paid back to Barclays? Were these loans ever paid back? Is it really the British banks just kind of, ah, let's sweep this under the carpet and pay this off with the relative numbers to the size of the banks and their holdings? Y you know, obviously the reputation is very important, but when you look at it, it it's they're they're kind of, ah, we'll, we'll take over this theft because we don't want our reputation to be dragged into it. So it's, it's great that, that in there is some sense of, of a happy, some, so, some sense of a partial happy you know, r resolution, but, but looking further into it is, it, is that were those loans ever paid back and, and how did that play out further? First, thank you a lot for this excellent lecture. Uh, have you been able to uh, consult the Arab Bank archives? Um. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is yeah. that it? Okay. Uh, were the loans paid back? I don't know. I would think they were. I mean, uh, because Barclays, you know, you're right. It's not just Barclays. It's Ottoman Bank as well. They were. It wasn't about the money, but they were. They could have. If it wasn't really about the money, they could have. What they could have done easily, is said, okay, the Israelis aren't freezing, unfreezing the money. Let's just pay out the customers anyway, rather than fighting all these lawsuits. And I saw the. You know, at some point they were thinking of doing that. And I saw. You know, Barclays didn't show me very much, but they showed me all their board meeting minutes. So that's how I can get at a lot of their decision making. And it's quite interesting. They were like, we're not going to double pay. We've already paid that money. We've written out these checks to the Israeli government, we're not going to write these checks again. So really they weren't that concerned about the money, but they were. They weren't going to pay twice. So I have a feeling they definitely would have been very careful about how the, and I've read the loan agreement. I don't know, I haven't seen, because that's not part of the story I was focusing on. I didn't see 12 years later that the Israelis pay them back. But I have a feeling that if they didn't, the, the bank would have threatened to sue, because it was important to them. And if it wasn't, then they wouldn't have gone through this very careful, you know, there were teams of lawyers that flew to, Tel Aviv to negotiate this loan agreement. You know, th there were different tranches of the loan. Two million was to go then. There was a waterfall payment. It was a pretty carefully constructed loan. I have a feeling that Barclays and Ottoman Bank cared very much about being repaid. If they didn't, why wouldn't they have just paid the customers, you know, to begin with? Why fly to Israel? And why threaten the Israeli government pulling out? So I think they did care about their bottom lines too, as banks do. Yes. No, it's a great question. I'd like to, I mean, I would like to, I w I'm almost certain it was paid back, but I should know that for sure. And I mean, all I can say is the banks took it very seriously. They weren't sweeping it under the carpet, you know, absolutely not. Um, I think they, if they'd wanted to do that, there was an easier way out, which is just pay out the customers to begin with. Your question about the Arab bank archives, no, I don't think there are any. I've talked a lot with the Arab bank, uh, particularly their Palestine branch. So I know their Mudis very well. They're a local Ramallah officer. And, you know, I tried to get to you know some of the story 
they have a uh, Abdul Hamid Shoman has an autobiography, which I read. The founder of the Arab Bank has an, but the actual archives, no, I don't think. I mean, I'm not aware that there are any. If there are, and if you can help me get to them, because I wrote a lot of emails to the the granddaughter of Abdul Hamid Shoman, who was at that point in time head of PR before before the Shomans got rid of the Arab Bank altogether. She was somebody who'd studied in the States, and I sort of really wrote these. I was like the Pal Palestinian Arabs writing to the British. I was writing these flattering emails, you know, from my Harvard emails saying, I would love to meet you. This is such an interesting story. I didn't mention anything about the lawsuits. I just said, I'm interested in understanding the history of the Arab Bank. Never once was there a response. Not once. But the, the people in Ramallah did help me a lot. They just didn't ever mention an archive in Amman or anything like that. So I'm not sure there is one. And if there is, and if you know anything about it, please do tell me. Uh, maybe we can talk after. Um, because it's very hard to, to get at that stuff. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Fascinating question. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much.